he will start his presentation. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, my name is Troy Bacon. I'm your organizer. Oh, please mute yourself. Mute yourself if you are just joined. Yeah, we can't have background noise right now. Mute yourself upon entry. That should be in the setting, but please mute yourself and stay muted until called on. Um, so for those of you who don't know, welcome to SUFON. And my name is Troy Bacon. And I'm one of the organizers of SUFON. I'm your host for this event. And our guest today is the, I think, fairly renowned uh, Preston Dennett. He is a, an investigator of the Mutual UFO Network. A, um, Preston, are you a current director of it? No. No, just okay. a field investigator and a member. Okay, just an investigating member. Um, Preston has written at least 30 books now, each on the UFO and ET contact um, topics, which, as far as I can tell, Preston, it seems that um, most, if not all of them, are more than just the contact themselves, but more of the consciousness and um, metaphysical and um, beyond physical contact and the effects of that. Is that correct? That's true. There's definitely a very strong spiritual and paranormal aspect to UFOs and UFO encounters. Okay. And that is the main focus of this event today that Preston will be outlining in his um, stories he'll be sharing from some of his books. Um, the, of course, as the title suggests, this is about UFO contact and human transformation. And all of his books are available on Amazon and other um, other platforms and bookstores. Um, he has been featured in magazines such as Fate, Atlantis Rising, Move on UFO Journal, Nexus, Paranormal Magazine, UFO Magazine, Phenomena, Phenomena Magazine, Mysteries Magazine, Ufologist, and others. And he continues to write books and investigate this broad, um, I think, almost limitless phenomena. And so I'll open the floor to Preston now and let him begin his presentation and screen share. Um, and he will take the floor and entertain us for um, over an hour with his stories. Go ahead, Preston. All right, thank you, Troy. Um, let me just get my PowerPoint presentation onto the screen here, and I will get going. Okay, you should be able to see that. Let me get from the beginning. Let me see, there we are. It's taking a second there. All right, so you can see the title page now? Yes, right. I can see that. Perfect. All right, well, let's just get started because I do have quite a few images and stories I'd like to present to you. And as you can see from this title slide, I'm going to be talking about UFOs and human transformation. Uh, before I do, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I came into this field as a complete skeptic, but in on November 17 of 1986, there was a report on the news about a sighting over Alaska. It's quite a well-known case involving a Japanese commercial airliner. Uh, the pilot with Captain Kenju Turochi and his crew saw a two actually very large walnut-shaped craft, much larger than their commercial airliner. It was on radar, uh, it tracked their plane for many miles, Really, none of this was in the news report, which was very tongue in cheek, but it interested me uh, because I couldn't believe that this pilot, this commercial pilot, 
was, I thought, basically throwing his career away by going public with this, which turned out to be true, by the way. He was grounded. He was no longer allowed to fly for many years. Uh, but it interested me enough to start asking people I knew because my brother, Mark, my older brother, had some years earlier come running into the house and said he'd seen a UFO. This is in Southern California where we lived outside of LA. And I wasn't ready to listen to him back then, but after hearing this report in the news, I approached Mark again and he described an incredible sighting of a metallic disc, which he chased in his car with his two friends. This disc had colored lights on it, it was silent, it was at treetop level, and they saw it for about 15 minutes. This is what broke through my skepticism. I started asking other people within my family and found out I had several family members, uh, friends, co-workers, people I loved and trusted who had been having encounters. This inspired me to buy some books on the UFO phenomena to disprove them, which of course didn't work. I found out this was a real phenomena. It had been widely reported across the world for decades, studied. It was a government cover-up. I quickly found MUFON and became a field investigator, started interviewing people formally, attending meetings, uh, investigating my own cases. And one thing led to another. And after about 10 years of researching and writing articles, uh, going on podcasts, I put out my first book. That was in 1996. And since then, I have been putting out quite a few books. Here are all the books I've published on just the UFO subject alone. So as you can see, I've become pretty obsessed with UFOs. But it's not just UFOs. It's the paranormal as well. I've written about 10 books on ghosts, Bigfoot, levitation, out-of-body experiences, uh, many different aspects of the paranormal, which I do think is connected to all of this. It became quite apparent to me early on that, yes, there were connections here. I understand there are a lot of investigators who are very nuts and bolts about this, but it became clear to me if we were going to get answers to this UFO subject, we needed to investigate all the evidence. There's a lot of cherry picking and shoe fitting, I think, people putting forth theories and then looking for evidence to support it. And I don't think that's true science. I think what you want to do is collect all the evidence you can and then put forth theories. And I do think we are dealing with extraterrestrials. And what I have found is it is an extremely transformative experience for people. This is what I would call a peak experience something that is one of the most profound experiences of a person's life, something that they will often think about daily for the rest of their lives following a sighting even, or a face-to-face -face encounter with the ETs, or especially if it's an on-board encounter. So this is something that challenges people uh, down to their core beliefs, challenges them on multiple levels, certainly mentally, as they try to figure out what is going on and explain it, but also physically. I mean, people are physically transformed by these UFO encounters, as we'll see, spiritually, emotionally, and really on all different levels. It affects what it means to be human. So what I'd like to do is pick some of the more profound stories from some of my books. I'm going to start with some simple sightings, which were very transformative to people, but move to more extensive encounters of face-to-face -face meetings with ETs and onboard UFO experiences. And one of the first encounters I investigated was a family friend by the name of Mark Grant, who was sitting with his friend Robin on Mulholland Drive overlooking the lights of the San Fernando Valley. This is part of Los Angeles in Southern California. And they saw these triangular formation of lights hovering in the sky. They started talking about it because they felt like it was watching them. And this is a clue. A lot of people do get this feeling that there is someone watching them as they are watching it. So after several minutes of this and discussing what these things might be, the next thing they knew, these lights came swooping down towards them. 
they had a little bit of confusion about time here. As a young investigator, I didn't quite recognize that that was a red flag for a possible missing time experience. They weren't really paying attention to the time, so they couldn't say. But judging from their emotional reaction, uh, they really quite freaked out. Uh, and the next thing they know, these objects are not coming towards them, but swooping away. So there was definitely some confusion, not only about time, but the placement of these objects. That is a real red flag. Missing time often does indicate a onboard experience that is somehow shrouded in amnesia. At any rate, this did have a profound effect on them. Like many investigators or witnesses, they didn't talk about it initially. And it was some years later that Mark Grant had another even more transformative encounter. He later became involved with drugs and alcohol, and it was destroying his life. So he joined a program, a wilderness challenge program, to overcome it, which he did. He successfully overcame his addictions. And to celebrate, they decided, a whole group, that they would climb Mount San Gorgonio. This is located in Southern California. It's quite a large mountain, but easily climbable. And they went to the top. It took them about three days. And they were camping on the top when something extraordinary happened. This glowing object came swooping down. It was totally silent. Could not have been a helicopter. This is quite high for a helicopter anyway. And they all felt like this was there was an intelligence to this object because it stopped, would hover, it would move around, and then stay in place. And it watched them for quite some time. According to Mark Grant, it was so bright, you really couldn't comfortably look at it. But they all felt that this object had come to sort of celebrate their overcoming of their addiction. They all thought it was a UFO. And I thought this was a particularly interesting case because mountaintops in many cultures are considered sacred spots. So there's some real interesting spiritual aspects to this. And this is when I started to notice that there is uh, this sort of uh, effect on people and that UFOs and UFO encounters do have a strong spiritual aspect to it that is largely ignored by a lot of researchers out there which I think is a mistake. So I started to see this more and more. Another lady I interviewed was a friend of my father's. Her name is Teresa. And she and her friend had gotten worn out and tired with society and their jobs and decided to take a vacation into a cabin in New Mexico, which had no electricity, no telephone. It was basically cut off from civilization. And they just spent a couple of weeks nurturing themselves, cooking and reading and sitting in front of the fire. And while they were there together, they saw flashes of light outside and heard weird computer-like music, very soft, like a computer tone. And uh, Teresa was quite entranced by it. Her friend was a little bit more skeptical. At any rate, her friend left early and Teresa stayed in the cabin and she kept hearing it. And uh, looking outside, she see this orb. And one day she was in bed when she heard this same computer-like music. So it was very soft, tone, tonal. And very quickly and without warning, this orb came zooming down towards her picture window, came in right up to the window or perhaps through it. She's not entirely sure, but it zapped her in the chest. And basically, she felt this incredible buzzing energy, almost like it was rejuvenating her in some way. And she felt unable to move, unable to cry out. And after a few moments of this, she started to get a little frightened and asked for it to move off, which it did. But she said it was actually a spiritually transformative experience, it completely changed her worldview. It let her know that such things like this do happen, and she became a huge believer in UFOs. So this is something that really does completely change a person's life, sometimes subtly, sometimes more so. 
even if it's a simple sighting. Another lady I interviewed, her name is Connie Lopez, pictured here. And I worked with her for many years. And she was not aware I was a UFO researcher until one day someone had given me a statue of a gray ET. And I put it on my desk. And she walked in and saw the statue and screamed out loud and pointed to it and said, what is that? I said, well, Connie, what do you think that is? She said, I don't know, but I can tell you I saw one of those. What is it? I said, Connie, that's a gray. Have you not heard of these? She's like, well, not really. I don't really watch TV. I'm like, well, tell me what you saw. And she described a very interesting experience, which completely changed her life. She had just had a new baby and was living with her husband in their home in Pacoima. This is outside of LA in Southern California, back in the late 1970s, I believe. And her baby was only a few days old. And she woke up one night to hear this strange squeaking noise. Uh, and she wasn't sure where it was coming from, but looking around, she saw a gray figure, a humanoid, at, in front of their picture window. And it appeared to be trying to open it. She said it was rubbing its hands up and down. And she looked on its hands and she could see little sort of sucker things like an octopus has. I thought that was a very interesting detail because that's something I rarely hear, but it has turned up. And as she's looking at it, she realized this thing is looking down at her baby and seems to be very much interested in her child. This is a pattern we do see. ETs do seem to be very much interested in human reproduction. Talked to a lot of people who had their encounters while they were perhaps eight, nine months pregnant or had just had a child. That's absolutely true in this case. So Connie, this, what's also interesting is this figure, this gray, who was about six feet tall, appeared to be trying to open the window, which doesn't open. It's a fixed window. You cannot open it. So I don't know why it couldn't figure that out. It's also strange because often these figures will just come in through the wall itself. They do have that ability. That's not what happened in this case. Connie had never encountered anything like this. She knew nothing about this. And she sat up in bed, alarmed, and went, wanted to go jump up and scoop up her baby. But she couldn't because at that moment, the ET looked at her. They locked gazes. And it slammed her down into the bed, apparently using mental force. They do have this ability. She says it was as if a pressure was holding her body down. She couldn't get up. She couldn't cry out. All she could do was feel the tears streaming out of the corner of her eyes as this figure continued for the next minute or so to try to open this window and get to her baby. And at some point, it just gave up and walked off. Connie immediately broke from the paralysis, jumped up and scooped her baby and woke up her husband. Uh, who told her, you must have just had a dream, a nightmare. She said, no, I did not. <laughs> this really happened, and I'm sure of it. And I am going over to my sister's house in the morning. Uh, they did not go to sleep after that, that night. And Connie did. She went over to her sister's and stayed there for the next week. And her husband finally said, are you coming home? And she agreed, but only on the condition that he buy guard dogs. So I mention this because this is something that's really affecting Connie emotionally. It absolutely scared the daylights out of her. So he bought guard dogs and she went home. But after a week or two, she says, I, I don't want to live here anymore. And they ended up selling their house and moving to another location. So this is how profoundly a person can be affected by an encounter. Uh, and uh, I think this is just, in this case, just an emotional sort of transformation. Uh, definitely let Connie know that these things do happen and that ETs are real, but she never realized that until she saw that statue of mine. And then ETs became more popular in the mainstream media. And she realized that this was exactly what she saw. 
Another lady I talked to um, lived actually in the same area by coincidence. You know, I, I was stationed in the LA area, so a number of my first cases were there, but I have talked to people from all over the world. At any rate, I talked to a lady by the name of Pat Brown, who contacted me to share her story. And she, at the time, she worked as a telephone operator and was very skeptical of UFOs. But she had a friend who wasn't and who had moved to Sedona, which is a major UFO hotspot. And her friend kept asking Pat to come visit her in Sedona. And they would go to see these people who channel ETs, walk-ins uh, is what her friend called them, people who claim to actually be psychically in touch with extraterrestrials and give messages to and from the ETs. Pat really had no interest in this, but her friend begged and begged. So one day Pat said, fine, and went to visit her friend in Sedona and went to see one of these channelers. And the guy claimed to be in touch with gray ETs. And Pat was intrigued by this claim. She says, well, if that's true, I'd like to meet these ETs. I'd like to go on board the craft. And the man who was channeling the ETs said, we will arrange it. And Pat didn't think much of it, went back to her condominium complex in Pacoima and woke up one day to see these figures coming through the wall. And she says it was terrifying. She did not like it at all. She felt an extreme sense of violation because they came in, they said, don't be afraid. We won't hurt you, but come with us. And she was not able to stop them from picking her up and taking her through the wall. And she doesn't really remember what happened after that. But this went on and on. And on one occasion, she did remember, she recalled being on board a craft, the greys were surrounding her, they were examining her, and she's fighting them all the way. She, in fact, she reached out and stuck her hand in one of the mouths of the ETs, as pictured here on the right, and tried to just rip it off and basically assault this gray. And the gray said, wow, she's really different tonight. And she thought that was a strange statement. So after a month of this, she became exhausted with all of this and said, if I'm really having encounters. I, I don't want to be afraid of it anymore. I want to know for sure. I want to go on the craft right now. And she did. She woke up. She was on the craft. And there was a human looking ET. And he led her to what, what he called her quarters, which was just a small little room with a bed in it. And Pat was quite surprised by this. And it ended up being a very spiritual encounter. This human looking figure started talking about Pat's past lives, showed her the feminine and masculine aspects of her body, actually took her out of her body in astral form and showed her a negative band of thought forms surrounding our planet. And they told her, you, your negative thoughts are creating this whole negative aura around your planet. She said it was very unpleasant to be next to and uh, really opened her eyes to all of this. But following this, she became a very spiritual person. And in fact, she ended up quitting her job and becoming a professional massage therapist and doing hands-on healing. This is a pattern I do see in many cases people following their onboard experience feel like they gain paranormal abilities of a wide variety. So this might include astral projection, clairvoyance, channeling, precognition, mediumship, all manners of paranormal abilities. But for Pat, it was healing. And she said that uh, often when she was doing healing, her patients would report blue light coming out of her hands. Uh, she, this happened often enough that she took note of it. And she said it was really interesting because often when she was doing these healings, she would get this image in her mind's eye of the greys up on the ship 
sitting at their little seats and their panels and sort of fiddling with the dials and stuff as if to facilitate her healing in some way. And I talked to Pat face to face. Uh, she has many testimonials attesting to her healing abilities. She's one of many people I've talked to who have described this. One lady I talked to had the same sort of experience following her encounter. She was healed of eczema and she felt she had the ability to do hands on healing. She quit her job as an actress and started doing hands on healing. And she offered to give me a healing. I went there and laid down on her table and she proceeded to do Reiki type of movements over me. And at some point, I saw what looked like pastel green and pink lights coming out of her hands. And I first thought I was seeing things, but then it became more pronounced. And I finally told her, I'm like, I think I've seen <laughs> weird lights. And she smiled real sweetly and said, oh, you see them. Some people do, some people don't. Uh, that's a good sign. Another lady, same thing, was having major onboard experiences, felt she had the ability to heal. Uh, she did heal someone of gestational diabetes, brought another person out of a coma. These were two instances that I was able to verify to a degree. And she offered to do a healing on me, and she was actually able to run energy up into my she grabbed my feet and ran energy up my legs, and I could physically feel it. So this is a big part of ET contact that I don't think gets enough attention. Another gentleman I interviewed was a Native American uh, from the Blood Tribe in Canada who had really extraordinary encounters. His name is Stan Hughes. He's a very nice gentleman. He's been to my home at least four or five times. I've interviewed him about his experiences over and over again. His story never changes. And really for him, it began when he took his family up to Lake Pondere, up in the Idaho Panhandle. It's a beautiful, deep, freshwater lake. And they would go up there because there would be what he called anomalous lights, uh, which would swoop around. Sometimes it was just a few of them. Sometimes there were several, but they were craft UFOs, he believed, and they would always be putting on a little show. It didn't happen every time, but it happened often. And one time they showed up in fairly large numbers, and one of them came swooping down right towards them at nearly eye level. And his little granddaughter said, Grandpa, they're talking to me. They're talking to me in my mind. What should I say? So this is something that really interested me because a lot of people do report telepathy. And he said to her, tell them you love them. And so in her little sweet voice, she says, I love you. And at that point, this craft came swooping down even lower to this point. It was just maybe 100 feet over them and it flashed a big, bright blue light over them. So it was in direct response to them. And this is how his encounters started. Talk to a lot of people who've had this sort of experience. Some will say they get a very strong impulse to look outside, and that's when a UFO will show up. Others will mentally call out to UFOs to come closer or do a little turn or something. And sure enough, it happens. So there is a very strong telepathic link in a lot of these cases. And that's absolutely true in Stan's case, and one time he was going camping on Thunder Mountain, something he really enjoyed doing, and uh, he woke up early one morning, packed up, and is taking his pickup down the, this dirt road at the base of the mountain when a UFO showed up. He heard this loud sort of whooshing sound, and suddenly this spherical, mirror-like silver craft came over his car from behind him and landed on the road in front of him well hovered about a foot off the ground but in essence landing and he was quite entranced by it felt no fear as a door opened and a human looking figure stepped out he said this human looking figure was wearing a blue jumpsuit had silver boots long dark hair dark eyes dark skin looked somewhat Middle Eastern, 
but very, very handsome. And he felt this incredible connection to this man. And Stan, uh, as a Native American, believes his ancestors are, in fact, extraterrestrials, star people. And seeing this human-looking ET, he was overcome with emotion and said, take me with you. And this man, who was smiling, at that point his smile faded, he waved goodbye uh, and turned around and went back into the craft. And the craft took off and Stan collapsed into tears. Uh, he said it was like meeting a friend and then having to say goodbye. And uh, it was a very emotional experience for him. In fact, every time he told me the story, he would get tears in his eyes. And it became one of many very spiritual encounters that he had with UFOs and ETs. Once he went camping on Sullivan Lake, and this UFO showed up, and it came close, and he started to get this real sense of warning or danger. And he didn't know quite what it meant. And it alarmed him. And he became frightened. And the UFO backed off and this feeling faded. Then the UFO came close again. And again, you got this feeling like something is wrong. Something needs his attention. There is an emergency going on someplace. But he didn't know what it was. Uh, at the time, it turned out his son had gone over to Europe as a foreign exchange student and came back incredibly depressed. And when Stan went home the next day, it turned out his son was having a suicidal episode. So he now believes this UFO was trying to warn him of that. And this is something I do see in other cases. Uh, UFOs will come when a person is having a very difficult time in their life. Uh, there was one gentleman who was, in fact, suicidal and had a gun to his head and was about to end his life. Uh, he had driven out to the Southern California desert. And this is when Grays showed up and he said, voided the suicide. I talked to another gentleman who was also having a very difficult time. He was suicidal. He did not like his job. He was very much depressed. The relationship with his girlfriend was not going well. And this is when a UFO showed up and beamed him, and it completely transformed him. Uh, his health problems disappeared. He was having a lot of trouble breathing and coughing up blood. That stopped. His depression lifted. He ended up leaving that toxic relationship. And he said he became very much interested in God and started having a lot of precognitive experiences. So here, once again, we see this pattern of spirituality. And in Stan Hughes's case, uh, his son was still having problems. So they had taken him to a traditional psychologist. It wasn't working. So they decided to do a Native American healing ceremony with him. And they took him to Priest Lake and did a sweat lodge and uh, brought the medicine healer over and did a whole uh, Native American healing ceremony for him. And during this ceremony, an apparition of a ghost appeared, and the son recognized it. This was a spirit obsession case. It turned out that the son, after going to Europe, learned that he was staying in the room of another teenager the couple whose house he was staying with, their teenager had committed suicide and had apparently attached himself to Stan's son and came home back to the U.S. So here this ghost appeared and freed himself from Stan's son, and they sent the spirit off. And at this point, a UFO came right down over the whole group. It was quite large, it was black, it had little lights on it, it was completely silent. And everyone uh, felt that this craft had come down to celebrate the successful healing of Stan's son from his psychological issues, uh, which was a permanent healing, by the way. His depression lifted, and he was able to live a normal life. So once again, we see a lot of these encounters having very spiritual aspects to them. And here's another gentleman which I'd like to talk about. 
Uh, I wrote about his case in one of my books. He, his name is, of course, Don Anderson, and he grew up in Spanish Fork, Utah. This is an area which does have quite a bit of UFO activity, actually. It's near the Wintaw Basin, not too far from the famous Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, but as a little boy, Stan had this problem with these strange figures entering into his bedroom. So they almost looked like little monkeys, but were kind of blue-skinned and troll-like, and really quite frightened him. And he told his mom, he lived alone with his mom, and she didn't believe him at first, but it became clear that he was telling the truth because he was quite upset about it and it kept happening. And uh, they actually ended up calling the police at one point. Uh, they brought doctors over. They did everything they could to try and figure out what was going on, but never could. And uh, Stan, or I mean, I'm sorry, Don, uh, grew up and started to have a number of strange experiences. Once he remembers walking near his house in the wilderness and being confronted by a herd of angry skunks who chased him down the mountain. He thought it was a very strange experience and there was something about it that he wasn't understanding. But it was one of many incidents that he just kind of passed off and didn't think about. There was another incident involving a very close up UFO sighting with his friend. And uh, again, he didn't really think much of it, wasn't connecting the dots that he might be a UFO contactee. Uh, but he did have missing time a couple of times but really didn't think about it. He was deeply religious. This might be one of the reasons. At any rate, uh, he grew up, uh, he got married, had a kid. The relationship didn't really work out. So he was a single parent with a five-year-old kid and woke up one day to see a gray coming into his room and taking his little five-year-old son. And Don jumped up and said, if you're going to take my son, I would like to go with you. And the gray said, yes, that's fine. And looking at the gray, Don had what he likens to a near-death experience. Because suddenly, he remembered all of his childhood UFO events in complete detail. All the missing time, all the UFO sightings came flooding back into his brain. Uh, he said it was very much like a life review. And that herd of skunks that he saw that chased him down the mountain were not skunks at all. They were greys. They led him on board a craft, which uh, he later realized was exactly like the craft Bob Lazar of Area 51 fame described. So he's a huge believer in Bob Lazar. And he was taken on board on that incident. And the ETs were basically teaching him and a bunch of other children uh, about language and psychic abilities and how to use their technology, which is very much psychically driven. And it was just a very spiritual experience for him. And he remembered other experiences. Uh, but moving forward, this ET took him and his son through the wall in a beam of light through the hillside, actually, into a craft that had landed behind their house. And Don found inside, himself inside this craft, uh, being escorted by a human looking female. He turned to her and said, you know, I'm having trouble with irritable bowel syndrome. I don't suppose you could heal it. And she just laughed and said, don't worry, that will clear up shortly. You're going to be just fine, but we need you to know something and took her into this room. And he saw his little son there playing with another boy that he did not recognize. They were perfectly fine having fun with one of these pieces of ET technology that would spill out sort of a light stream. At any rate, the woman that Don was talking to said, you need to know that you will be meeting a woman in the near future. And she will be a very important relationship. And we want you to make sure that you uh, accept her invitation when she 
asks you to meet with her. And he said, okay. And that was basically the whole point of this meeting, this female entity said. And it was a pretty short onboard encounter. He was put back into his home. And sure enough, after a year or two passed, this woman did show up in his life. He recognized her immediately. It did become a very important relationship in his life. And even more interesting, this child that he had seen playing with his son on board the UFO became his son's best friend. This other child had moved into the same neighborhood and they became best buds for a number of years until the kid finally moved away. So this is a number of cases where people have described to me being given information about their future. Another gentleman told me how the ETs showed him which house he would be living in, again, who he would marry, and so forth. Another, I mean, I hear this all the time. One lady who had uh, visitations with Grays, the Grays told her that she would be getting a raise at work, what would happen with her relationship, and told her various things that would happen. So again, this is the sort of things you don't hear a lot about in some UFO encounters, but I've come to realize this is a consistent feature of UFO encounters. Don's story is quite extensive. Uh, later, as an adult, he went out with some friends uh, very near, again, the Skinwalker Ranch area, and they had a trailer out in the wilderness, and uh, they decided to do some CE5 work Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, which is basically meditation to call down a UFO and make contact with ETs. This again points to the spiritual aspect. You can reach out to them telepathically, mentally, and initiate an encounter. And to their shock, it worked. This sort of V-shaped, boomerang-shaped object showed up, cleared out the clouds. There was a very low cloud cover and revealed itself. And it was shortly after that, that praying mantis beings showed up around the trailer and started revealing themselves uh, very much coyly, not getting too close. Uh, and Don kept asking, let me see you better. And he would hear in his mind, no, you're not ready yet. But that night, they decided, you know, suddenly, let's go to bed. Uh, without any real discussion, everyone just suddenly knew it was time to go to bed. And the next thing Don knew, he was being escorted by a praying mantis ET, very much like pictured here, uh, onto what's presumably the same sort of uh, V-shaped craft. And he said it was a very pleasant encounter. He felt no fear whatsoever. He was taken on board, and he said that there were these three sort of catwalks, and he walked up to this center right here where there was a pedestal and a large, almost crystal-like object. And he said, what's this? And the praying mantis tilted his head and said, you know, basically said, put your hands on it. And all these images started going through this ball. And Don could see this was images of not only his life in his past, but apparently future events. And he's like, what is this? <laughs> what is this thing? And the praying mantis seemed to be searching for the right words and finally said, deja vu. So Don was still a little puzzled about it, but the praying mantis took him into another room and told him to go in there. And when Don stepped into this room, this sort of laser-like light came down and shined on his body, kind of covering him from head to toe, up and down. And Don asked again, what is this? What, why, are, why are you having me do this? And the praying mantis tilted his head again and said, soap. So it was sort of his way of saying, this is, I think, a decontamination chamber. And this is certainly something I've heard described many times. Betty Andreessen, a very well-known contactee, described this same thing. So this went on. It was a long, involved encounter. At one point, he was shown a meeting, and 
with a bunch of ETs sitting around a table and a beam of light came up and connected all of them. And he was told that this was a way for them to share their knowledge. And he's not exactly sure what happened there. He doesn't really remember that part clearly, but he does remember how this experience ended. They took him up to the top of the ship and all the walls turned transparent and he could see that he was outside in a star field far, far away from any uh, star constellations we have here. And he says it was amazing because he could hear this sort of ohm noise, very musical. And the ETs told him this is the sound that the universe makes. So this was an incredibly spiritually transformative experience for Don. And he started having all kinds of uh, abilities with astral travel, uh, spirit communication. He started seeing a lot of spirits, uh, started uh, learning about his past lives, could look at other people and read their auras, uh, their health situation, their past lives, talk to their deceased relatives. The whole experience became incredibly spiritual for him. At one point, he became very ill with a chest cold, and it just wasn't going away. And uh, one day, he's just in his restroom in his home, and this figure, pictured here, this is drawn by my sister-in-law, Christine Kisara, showed up, and he said, this figure, although it looked human, was clearly not. Uh, his face was very sculpted. The skin was incredibly pale and smooth. His eyes were far too large for a normal person. And he was holding this pink vial of neon looking liquid and handed it to Don and said, drink this, this will heal you. Don took the vial, the little beaker thing and drank the liquid, which he said was viscous, largely tasteless uh, and handed the vial back. And this figure walked, said, you'll be fine and walked out through the wall. This was not Don's only healing. He had earlier had some real severe heart problems and he was taken on board and healed of that as well. But following this event, his chest cold completely cleared up. He says he hasn't had colds or flu since. But this became such a spiritually transformative experience for Don that he spoke publicly about it and really doesn't like to dwell on his actual experiences. For him, it's all about the spirituality. And he ended up doing a website in which he offers spiritual readings and guidance to people. It's called The Path of Shabala. The ETs told him, this is what we want you to call it, Shabala. And he thought, Sh Shambala? They're like, no, Shabala. And they spelled it out for him. And this completely changed Don's life. He ended up writing books about his experiences. And he still runs this website today and is helping a lot of people. And again, this is a pattern I see with a lot of contactees. At some point, they turn their, service, their abilities towards the service of humanity. And this was a pattern I found with many contactees. I started to look at who is being contacted and why because it's equally divided between men and women. It's people all over the world. It's sometimes very young people, sometimes very old, and certainly not related to blood type, which was a big thing for a while. People were talking about RH negative, but I've talked to people of many blood types of all ancestries, Native American, Caucasian, Latino, um, Asian, Pacific Islander. Everyone all over the world is having encounters. But after interviewing a lady from Norway, I figured out a pattern. She had called me up because she was interested in my research into UFO healing cases. And she had had Grays come into her room and flip her around like a rag doll, put an instrument up against her back and healed her of a chronic back problem. And I asked her if she had any history of encounters because that is a pattern. Many people who do have encounters it's in their family. Uh, ETs do seem to be interested in following genetic lines. 
But that was not true in her case. This was a one-off. She had never had a UFO encounter before or since. But she says, they healed my back. I'm like, well, that's very interesting. And I got all the details of it. Uh, she says it was really quite frightening. The Greys never answered any of her questions. It was all over in about two minutes. And they just filed out through the wall. She ran up to the window and thought she saw what might have been the light of their craft because it was all lit up like blue. I finally asked her what she did for a living. And she became a little bit quiet. And she says, well, you're not going to use my name, are you? And I said, no, no, of course not. And uh, she says, well, you know, I'm, I was a graphics artist, but I retired. And now I'm very active in my community doing animal rights and human rights activism. And that rang a bell for me because I had recently interviewed a gentleman who was very active fighting against racism. And he had an encounter in which he was healed of a blood clot. And I started thinking through all my cases. I'm like, wow, I have got an awful lot of social workers, doctors, teachers, artists, musicians, people who are doing good work for humanity in some capacity. So that, I think, is a pattern. Absolutely. I interviewed one couple who were driving through Sedona and had a UFO land next to them. They were pulled on board. He was healed of carpal tunnel syndrome and a bad knee. And the wife asked them, why don't you just come down and fix all our problems? And they said, we can't do that. There are karmic laws. I thought this was a very interesting statement because this I have heard in other cases. And it shows that the ETs are aware of karma. And they said, basically, it's up to you to solve your own problems. We can intervene, but only to a limited extent. We can help, we can guide, we can teach, we can heal, but you have to solve your own problems. And what was interesting to me is that these, this couple, William and Rose Shellhart, were very active in their community. She did herbal healing and had quite a number of testimonials in support of her. And he was a social worker. He would go around from house to house helping people with construction problems and fixing up their homes and help maintaining them. So again, here's the same pattern we see over and over again. One lady from Indiana contacted me because she had gone to the dentist, uh, brought her teenage son to the dentist, and the dentist freaked out because there was this foreign body beneath one of his molars, as you can see pictured here in these x-rays. And the dentist asked, what is this? Did your son shoot himself in the mouth with the BB gun? The son denied it. And of course, the mother did as well. This did not happen. And the dentist said, well, yeah, we didn't think so, but we don't know how to explain this because the tooth is asymptomatic. There's no sign of any entry wound. But whatever is underneath this tooth, it's not natural, it's metallic, it's perfectly round, it's quite large, and uh, it's good evidence that it is not man-made. So this, of course, really freaked out the mother, and uh, she didn't know what to make of it, and she asked her son about it, and he says, I have no idea, I really don't. Uh, so they went back to the dentist a year later. It was still there. Uh, and this became a, a mission of her. She wanted to find out what this was and started going on the internet looking for an explanation uh, and couldn't find anything except possible ET implant. And uh, sh she finally contacted me and asked me if I knew anything about this. I said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. This is quite commonly reported among contactees, which it is. Uh, and I've heard this many times. And people have sent me similar evidence. And I've had contactees ask flat out, what is the purpose of these implants? And they were told that the purpose of these implants is usually health related. One was told it was to measure the level of pollution in her body. Another was told it's to measure your vital signs. Another was told it's to boost your immune system. 
but generally speaking, it's health related. It's not tracking or mind control or anything nefarious as some researchers have postulated and speculated without any real evidence. Uh, and I've come to realize it is health related because I have other cases that point towards this. For example, a lady lost her implant and became very sick. The ETs took her back on board and re-implanted her and she was healed again of a hypoglycemia type illness. So the mother was quite at a loss. She contacted me and I asked her, do you have any history of UFOs? And she denied it. She says, no, I really don't think I do. I'm like, well, does your son? And she says, no, I asked him and he said no. And I'm like, well, can I talk to him? And he did not want to talk to me. He's a little bit autistic, uh, which is actually not uncommon among the contactee population. And uh, she asked him uh, while I was talking to her on the phone, and says, honey, have you ever seen a UFO? And he says, well, mom, yeah, I have. And she says, what? Why didn't you tell me? He says, well, I didn't want to scare you. You were freaking out. And she said, tell me what happened. And he described how he was walking home right before this implant had been found because he had gone to the dentist prior and there was no implant. And these blue and yellow lights showed up, swooped down, started flashing all these colored lights at the boys. It frightened them a little bit and they ran inside. I think possibly this was more than just a simple sighting. I've come to realize that if a UFO is within a couple of hundred feet of a person, or it's communicating in any way, there are deeper levels of contact, not necessarily an onboard experience, but certainly possibly. And the boy did admit that he was having dreams about human looking ETs. Uh, some call them Nordics. I don't like that term. I don't think it's fully accurate, but the boy had become very much interested in extraterrestrials and was looking at stories online. And so this, really freaked out the mother and she wanted answers and she was praying for answers and finally one day she woke up and there was a gray at the door uh mind you this is this mother and son live alone she's adopted she came from a very abusive family an abusive relationship uh doesn't have a whole lot of funds so it's just basically her and her son against the world and they've got a very close relationship. And they lived in a tiny little uh, apartment where they shared a bedroom. And this gray came walking in and the mother felt this incredible sense of calm. And she felt that this gray was saying, you don't need to worry, everything's fine. You're going to be all right. Your son's going to be all right. You have no reason to be afraid. Everything's just, everything's gonna be just fine. And these grays went over to her son's bed and began working on him. And she watched it happen. And at some point they left. She woke up the next morning and said, guess what, honey? I think the ETs came. And he said, they came for you? She said, no, honey, they came for you. He's like, oh, I wonder if my implant is still there. They went to the dentist just a few weeks later. It was still there. It took three x-rays actually. And at some point the implant disappeared and came back, which really freaked out the dentists, but this does happen. At any rate, following this, the mother felt completely transformed. Uh, not only did she have the answers she was seeking, uh, she and felt much more comforted. It really changed her life. She was quite obese at the time. Well, not obese, but needed to lose some weight, was not eating healthy. And she says, following this experience, she no longer felt the need to eat junk food and improved her diet, began working out. And she started having memories of contact that had occurred earlier. And she does remember them coming uh, throughout her life. So this, like Don Anderson, sparked memories that she had previously denied or buried. And it wasn't long after that that she was pulled on board again. And she said it was quite strange because the room was dressed up like a living room, like a doctor's office. It had a couch. There was another gentleman sitting there. And suddenly in walks this very tall praying mantis type being. 
and it came up to the boy and held this instrument up, up against his neck and walked up to her and said, now it's your turn. And she said, no, I don't want you to do that. Uh, but that's all she really remembers. Uh, why I wanted to include this case is because her son is very special. She says it is daily that he has clairvoyance, deja vu, precognition. Uh, he's got a real aura about him that even strangers notice uh, who will walk up to him and give him money and just he's incredibly profoundly psychic. Uh, this is a daily thing. And she wondered if she asked me about this. She says, is, is that a pattern that turns up? And I said, yes, absolutely it does. Uh, contactees, as a general rule, are profoundly psychic. This can be a two-way street. It can happen before, during, or afterwards. 